One of the things about combined and uneven development in the, develop in the first industrial revolution was that the, the uh, industrialization that took place was quite decentralized. It was spread all over the, the settled parts of the countries, which meant the maritime provinces, uh, the, uh, St. Lawrence Valley in Quebec, southern Ontario, even a bit in British Columbia in the, the, by the 1860s and 70s in Victoria and Vancouver. Um, these were places that had set up industries that, for the most part, were going to run year-round. They would pr might well close down for a while, but this made them quite different from the great pre-industrial industries where workers have been drawn together, say, in the fur trade or in the lumbering industry, where they were just used for a season and sent home to do something else. The difference this time is that employers wanted these workers to, to stay, to stay as long as they could. They, this, they wanted them to be permanent employees they had some laborers that they would use on a uh, daily basis and send them packing, but they, the workers that they were putting on the machines or the skilled workers they brought in, they wanted them to become committed to being workers, no longer saying this is just part-time, this is just something I do before I become a farmer, which had been the old, the old uh, experience of pre-industrial uh, wage earning. Now wage earning was supposed to be something you did for life. and. Uh, Immigration encouraged that to bring in as many people as possible, not entirely successfully in Canada because the opportunities were greater in the United States, so we bled heavily with lots of new immigrants who arrived and, and took off. But nonetheless, in cities like Montreal, St. John, New Brunswick, Halifax, um, Toronto, Hamilton, and several other southern Ontario cities, Vancouver, Victoria, groups of workers began to settle in. They would move around for sure, but there were communities of workers that began to develop that were more or less permanent, that workers would feel themselves to be uh, part of an ongoing process uh, of industrial development. Equally true, out of these major, uh, more metropolitan centers, in the mining communities, there were considerable numbers of coal miners who were brought in, often with their skills intact from wherever they'd been brought from who settled into um, mining towns in Nova Scotia and in, and in British Columbia in considerable numbers. Coal being, of course, a hugely important commodity for the d development of an industrial revolution because you've got to feed those steam engines. And uh, they, too, became relatively permanent, long-lasting um, long communities of workers who had developed their own sense of their identity and their interests. And that's the key part of the story in some ways, because you can, you can recruit people to come and work for you, and you have a certain sense of how they're going to uh, fulfill your needs as a, as a workforce. But they develop their own sense of what they want out of their, their lives, and they, they develop households with their families, or perhaps with if they're just single, with other bachelor uh, boarding house residents. Um, but they develop community organizations, they develop uh, habits of uh, spending their social time, and they begin to talk about their particular needs and interests, which draw them together increasingly by the 1870s and 80s into organizations that we recognize as unions, the organizations that uh, represent wage earners in the workplace and will raise issues that will um, uh, try and better their conditions in the workplace. To the greatest extent, this was the more skilled workers. There's, there's an uneasy uh, and quite inaccurate assumption that in the old days before the Industrial Revolution, we had skilled workers, and then along came the Industrial Revolution, we had none. And in actual fact, a large number of the workers that were brought into industry were brought into what, we, what we've taken to calling manufactories. They were a kind of middle zone between the old artisanal shop and the, and the full-scale, highly tech, uh, technologically sophisticated factory. And they largely worked at their their traditional crafts, although those increasingly got altered in different ways, perhaps narrowed in some ways, some of their, their tasks would be taken away, some of their um, independence on the job would be taken away. But there were large numbers, thousands of craft workers working inside industry. And they began to feel the pinch. They didn't like the way they were being treated and thought their best interests weren't being uh, pursued. So that uh, the first organizations that are created are craft unions that are uh, concerned about trying to, to better those conditions to make sure that they can uh, preserve what they understand to be the, tr the tr traditions and expectations of the craft, which they don't believe their employers are any longer respecting. 
It's not a, a world anymore where there's a master craftsman and a bunch of journeymen and some apprentices, all of them sharing the craft tradition. They feel like the employers have abandoned that. They've become capitalists who want to run industry, who want to make a profit out of industry, and don't care about the craft. So it's up to craft unions to to make that uh, that commitment to do so. A similar development happens in the mining communities where they are uh, equally concerned about what happens to the, the traditions of their mining crafts and how they're treated and, uh, and, and, and uh, mistreated. And so equally and so slightly later, they develop a, a set of mining unions that are, um, uh, whose goal is to, is to pursue the best interests of uh, working miners in the, in the mining towns of the, on the two coasts.